everybody. Hello, welcome, welcome. Hello. Hi everyone, this is PDA, Progressive Democrats of America, our healthcare emergency town hall. Welcome everybody, good to, good to see you here. Uh, I am Bill Honigman, Dr. Bill in Orange County, California. I am having internet connection problems all of a sudden. It's a cable company. And uh, my good friend, uh, Danette uh, Abbott-Wicker, who lives in an adjacent town who's not having cable connection problems, she might have to step in for me as uh, kind of the guest moderator today. But, um, but otherwise, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and uh, please, now's a good time to say uh, who you are, where you're from. Uh, just say hi to the group. We'll do that for a few minutes. I see Mary Carter from Laguna Beach, California. Good to see you here with us. Um, anyone else like to say hi and where are you from? There's Dr. Dave Sonneborn from Orange, California. Chuck Pinocchio from Philadelphia, PA. Uh, Jim Langford, who's uh, helping out co-hosting the meeting from Florida. Our guest speaker today, uh, Georgia Davenport from the Spokane. Can Eastern Area Washington State. Good to see you, Donna Smith, our uh, chair of our PDA National Advisory Board. Alan Minsky, executive director of PDA from Los Angeles. Donna, of course, from Denver, Colorado area. Um, who else? Uh, anyone else like to jump in? Say Jay hi. Walsh. Where you're from? Jay Walsh, Morgan, in North Carolina. Hi, James. Good to see you. That's right. There's Janice Kay from Florida. Also, she's our social media director. Dan O'Neill from Phoenix, Arizona. Who's uh, Fergie hey, Reed hey, from Los Angeles. Hey, Fergie. Good to see How you. you. All right. Beverly Nelms. Bruce Walker, Peter Falls, Iowa. All right, Beverly Nelms, uh, one of our phone bank champions from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Good to see you with us. Mike Fox, of course, who's uh, Deputy Executive Director of PDA, is hosting our meeting also from St. Petersburg, Florida. Ron Hello from New York. Judy. This is Barbara Warren from New York. Ron Kimbrough from New Jersey. Hey, All right. Hi, Boston. Wonderful. Schiffer from Menlo Park, California. Wonderful. Thank Kristen you. Kristen from Virginia. Excellent. Elizabeth Palacio from um, Northwest Indiana. Excellent. Morrison Thank from Hayward, California. Elizabeth Martin. Judy Miller, Tacoma, Washington. Debbie Thank Perkins you. Kalama, Albany, California. Martha Pinkus from Fox Point, Wisconsin. Awesome. Thank Bill you. Friedman. Bill Friedman from Mesa, Arizona. Terrific. Thank you, Bill. Harriet Carvingo calling from Zihuatanejo, Mexico. <laughs> ah. Thank oh, you, wow. Harriet. Excellent. Uh, Ann Jones from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yes, good to see you, Ann. Thank you. Ruth, Ruth Mike, Carter from Northern California. Good to see you, Ruth. Mike Fowler Hi, from San Diego. I see you, Hi, too. Cindy. Hand Hello. Away from you. <laughs> good, good. Thanks. Um, Jean Hagen from Iowa City. Thank you, Jean. All right. Well, that's a Hi. that's a nice uh, start. Hi, Greg Dukowski from Rock Hall, Maryland, and yeah. uh, I just bought three shares of Zoom today for my retirement <laughs> plan. So thank you all for making me rich. Maybe you could uh, buy a control interest of Cox Cable and get them to uh, fix my internet. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Mike Fox. Why don't we uh, roll into the recording and get this meeting going for good? And we can mute all. All right, Dr. Bill, it's all yours. Okay, great. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Great, thanks so much, Mike Fox, Deputy Executive Director, Progressive Democrats America for hosting. Thank you, Alan Minsky, Executive Director, Janice Case, Social Media Director for PDA for your help. Thanks, PDA National Staff. 
Donna Smith, PDA National Advisory Board Chair for your help preparing for and promoting these national town hall meetings. And thanks to our many donors for making it possible for us to set up this meeting space in Zoom and on Facebook and YouTube Live with archived recordings. And huge thanks to everyone for joining us once again today. I'm Dr. Bill Honigman, a retired emergency room physician from Orange County, California. And this is the PDA Healthcare Emergency Online Town Hall meeting for Sunday, January 10th of 2021, which is now number 49 in our weekly series that began back in the spring of last year when we all first went into mass isolation because of the novel coronavirus infection known as COVID-19. Once again, we at PDA recognize the need for political organizations and public leaders, especially to step up and not step back in this time of healthcare and climate crises. So we stepped up our previously once a month national group meetings to once a week. And by recognizing as we do here at PDA that the current crisis of this pandemic is a giant wake up call for Medicare for all and for the Green New Deal. This week while here at home, we both celebrated unprecedented wins in the Georgia US Senate runoffs and recoiled in horror at a violent insurrection at our nation's capital. Worldwide, total cases of COVID-19 rose by another 5 million new cases with a total death toll of nearly 2 million. And the US, Russia, and the UK especially still are showing the most new coronavirus cases overall. It should be a particularly shameful note to us as Americans this week, as in all weeks so far this, during this pandemic, that the COVID cases per capita for the US remains about five times that of the global rate. And the US greeted this second week of the new year with a total of 372,651 COVID-19 deaths to date with a new record daily death toll just this last Thursday, January 7th of 4,080. The well-publicized onslaught of COVID-19 victims and medical needs in areas like Los Angeles, California continues, but also reports are now emerging from other parts of the country, like Kentucky, where Governor Andy Bashir recently reported that they were experiencing a quote, real and significant increase in cases and our positivity rate from people's <laughs> gatherings around the holiday. And Colorado's state epidemiologist reported similarly on the effect of the holidays, concluding that it's believed now to be about one in 105 residents there in Colorado that are currently contagious as a result. Indeed, this week's insurrection event at the Capitol, much like the South Dakota gathering of science deniers last summer, is largely being viewed now as, among other things, having itself been a super spreader event, with Dr. Robert Redfield, the current director of the CDC, saying this about it. Quote, you had largely unmasked individuals in a non-distanced fashion who were all through the Capitol. Then these individuals all are going in cars and trains and planes going home all across the country right now, end quote. Now, this is the height of arrogance and irresponsibility, at least to those of us who do believe in science and the sanctity of human life. How then to reconcile the policy, process, and personality that we all witnessed this week to bring us closer to the ultimate goal of recognizing single-payer expanded and improved Medicare for All and the Green New Deal as necessities in confronting the existential threats of health, climate, racism, poverty, war, and political corruption? This week also saw the re-election of Representative Nancy Pelosi to the House Speakership position, despite a popular push to, quote, force the vote on Medicare for all. Most here would likely agree that this was a tactical error in that progressives in the House didn't have the strength to propose a strong enough alternative 
as a house leader. So how do we transition back from force the vote to move the vote? Or like the Bernie Sanders delegate said during the Democratic National Convention this past summer, pass the damn bill. And in particular, how do our national maladies of pandemic and political upheaval set the stage for our movement going forward? How do we best seize this particular political moment to help bend the arc of the moral universe toward Medicare for all and healthcare justice? Well, to discuss these issues of strategies and tactics for our movement, we have a fantastic advocate and organizer from Washington State as guest speaker today, uh, a good friend, Georgia Davenport, who I've had the pleasure of knowing now for some time through our work together, especially in the One Payer States Organization and in meetings such as the National Single Payer Strategy Conference, which convenes again just uh, this month, a bit later this month. Uh, Georgia and others, including our old friend Chuck Pinocchio, who's the lead organizer of the One Payer States Group, are working on a campaign to gain more popular support for the reintroduction in particular of the Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act, which apparently had new pay-go exemptions negotiated between the authors and Speaker Pelosi. So it's now very promising that this bill, which most of us agree would be a giant step toward Medicare for all, might be heard in the various committees of jurisdiction and possibly moved to a floor vote. So I'm eager to hear from Georgia on how we can uh, help in this process. And I'm delighted once again to have PDA National Advisory Board Chair Donna Smith here to further introduce Georgia as well. But first, before we get to our terrific guest speaker, let's bring up Ellen Minsky, PDA Executive Director for a few remarks, and Mike Fox of St. Petersburg, Florida, who's National PDA Deputy Executive Director with a couple of brief reports from the field and a brief preview of this week's PDA to-do list, which we always come back to by the end of the hour for more details. So Mike Fox, uh, if you're there and if I'm still there, if I still have my internet connection, Mike Fox, it's all yours. Thank you. Actually, we're gonna to go to Alan first, Dr. Bill. Oh, uh, very good. Hello, everybody. So um, first of all, um, I want to drop into the chat a tech, a link here for, um, it is a petition that we've signed on to, to remove Trump from office. This is something that I've been in direct contact with Representative Ilhan Omar's office about, uh, and along with Representative uh, Ciceline from Rhode Island, that is the formal um, bill that will be introduced to call for impeachment. Uh, um, ASAP in the House of Representatives. So that is something that everyone should sign on to for that. Now, I also then want to add a second uh, link into the chat, which is uh, something that PDA has initiated, which is a call for um, us to have one person oversee the vaccine distribution in the United States of America. What we're looking at right now is a catastrophe in this country. And, um, and Daily Coast picked up, on our, um, picked up on our call that we made last week that the Biden administration needs to be fully coordinated um, as they uh, send out the vaccines. What's transpiring right now is leading to tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths across the country. We as a society do not need to be stuck inside this hell for another six months. We have um, the greatest communication and transportation infrastructure that any society has ever known in history. And the continued mismanagement of the distribution of the vaccines to the American population is unforgivable. We are asking Biden to do this in the spirit of cooperation. Uh, we understood that the Trump administration, we anticipated that they would make a total mess of it, a worse mess, a complete human disaster of it. They have done exactly that. But also the states and local um, governments have been starved of resources during this pandemic. They received no aid in the latest national care package. And it is incumbent for the sake of saving, again, 
thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of American lives, which are eminently savable, that we all assist in this process. And as citizens, we need to speak up and ask the Biden administration to have clear national unified leadership, putting somebody in charge of all of the resources of the federal government to achieve as rapid a vaccination of the American population as can be done. Um, you may notice in the text of what I just dropped in, and I'll drop in into the chat one more time, I encourage everybody to send this petition out to everyone they know. Um, and it also calls for the United States helping facilitate international vaccines around the world as well. So I really wanted to say that. Now, just this morning, and Mike Fowler, who's on the call, first of all, heartfelt condolences, Mike, for your family's loss. That is truly tragic. Um, and Mike is, is a great leader of PDA California. Dr. Bill uh, wears many hats, including being the state coordinator of PDA. Um, and I'll bring this, be bringing this to Mike and Dr. Bill and California activists as it evolves. But just this morning, I got involved in an initiative with some groups that have literally millions of Californians on their, uh, they have um, the contact information for them. And these organizations want to partner with PDA and invited us to partner in trying to do phone banks out to California citizens to make them better aware about how the vaccine process will proceed in California. This is just a developing project. And, um, but I do wanna let this call know because by next week, I hopefully will be able to provide an update on this. There's a, a terrible situation out here in Southern California in terms of the pandemic. The particular contact information of 3 million households are from low-income Californians. The people who are dying are concentrated, particularly in working class communities of color here in Southern California. So whatever um, we do as activists, we are here in the service of um, the welfare and lives of the people. And it could be an opportunity for all of us on this call to make a massive contribution if this particular project can be brought forward uh, to assist the state of California and of course the people around the country in getting vaccines out to people in California. So I'll provide an update on that within the week or on next week's call. And in the meantime, um, please sign the PDA uh, petition. We're partnering with Daily Coast, again, calling for a national vaccine distribution coordinator to be named so that we can, uh, again, get this done much more efficiently than the way it's been transpiring. Um, the language, by the way, just to end, the language that I wrote last week in an email relating it to the FDR administration and their performance in transforming the US economy after the depression and then transforming all of American industry um, in order to build up the armaments necessary to fight World War II and the rapidity at which that was achieved. They're not in this language for reasons of trying to get as many signatures across all political spectrums as possible, uh, but that is very much at the heart of PDA's understanding about what needs to be done, what can be done and what must be done. So I really wanna thank Mike Fox, Dr. Bill, Donna, and everybody here for allowing, um, allowing me the time to say all this today. Thank you so much. And I think I toss back to you, Mike Fox. Thank you, Alan. And uh, sorry, multitasking. Uh, very quick on to-dos, gang. Uh, we got a packed house today. That's beautiful to see. Uh, number one to-do is everybody. Revel in the fact that you are surrounded by people who get it. Please take healing energy from this uh, from this call. Uh, and uh, again, my condolences, Mike Fowler. Um, secondly, make sure you got something to take notes with because there's an awful lot of good information here. Speaking of which, in the lower right hand corner, if you are um, on via Zoom and not on the phone, in the lower right hand corner of the chat, if you click on the three dots there, you'll see an option to save chat. Uh, you're going to want to do that before you before you hop off of here, because there's going to be a boatload of very important links that are going to be tossed into this chat. So make sure you do that before you log off. Uh, other two major to do's here are, uh, number one, our goal on this call is always to get active, active, active. We have a goal of five 
folks, new folks who have not yet participated in any of our campaigns associated with this effort. Uh, so please do uh, just type into the chat if you're up for doing a little bit of volunteering. That's wonderful. And then lastly, uh, donations, donations, donations. Our goal is always five new donors. Uh, we have a monetary goal that we'll share with on the back end. But uh, if you can toss a few pennies and tip jar here to uh, help us um, expand this campaign, uh, we will be forever in your debt. So that is all back to you, Dr. Bill. All right. Well, thank you, Mike Fox. And we will come back to you at the end of the hour uh, to kind of recap those to do's. And as always, um, you can contact uh, Mike Fox at pdamerica.org. That's Mike Fox at pdamerica.org uh, with questions uh, for him. Alan is A L A N, Alan at pdamerica.org, and myself, Dr. Bill at pdamerica.org. If you'd like to connect any of our speakers, um, including our guest speaker coming up. Uh, so, and um, uh, just uh, by way of um, explanation, the uh, I think um, our speaker last week, uh, Michael Lighty, had a, had a wonderful slide presentation. A number of you asked for the file. I just uh, received that. And so I will get that out to all of you who emailed me uh, for his slides uh, shortly. So um, hang in there, uh, they're coming your way. So um, uh, having said that, let me bring up uh, Donna Smith and uh, with a few more words about our guest speaker, uh, Georgia Davenport. Thank you, Thank Donna. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Bill. Can you hear me okay? Sure can, thanks. Great, great. Thank you so much. This is Donna Smith. I'm in Denver, Colorado today where the sun is shining, although it snowed yesterday. So that's our usual uh, for that. Uh, I have the pleasure today of introducing Georgia Davenport. And uh, one of the things that I have found most remarkable over many years is watching the energy and the drive that activists for Medicare for All in Washington state have put forward to really move this issue forward. And Georgia is certainly among one of the movers and shakers in Washington state. She's just come off a run for the state legislature. Yay, Georgia. Um, she didn't make it this time, but let's hope that she'll run again another time. Uh, the person she was running against was truly despicable. So it would be great if uh, she would uh, consider doing that again, I'm, I'm very pleased to say. Washington State has also had an interesting um, history with their work on single payer and Medicare for all, much like Colorado has had, a little bit differently in that there are groups that really are strongly in, uh, in support of moving forward on a state basis and others that are working really hard on uh, moving the national legislation forward. Those groups are not arguing with one another. They are just working on different paths forward. And sometimes there's lots of crossover and that can be hard to manage in a volunteer setting. But I think Georgia and the activists in Washington state have <clears throat> done a brilliant job of doing that. Georgia, you live in one of the pretty, prettier parts of the state, I think. I have relatives in Spokane. So that it makes me very happy to be able to introduce you today and thank you for all the work and the fighting you've done for Medicare for All and Justice and Healthcare. Take it away, Georgia, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Donna, and thank you, um, Dr. Bill, for uh, inviting me to this meeting. I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I didn't win my race for state legislature, but this week I just won um, to be on the state committee for Stevens County um, Democrats. So that was, um, it was sad that I didn't win <laughs> uh, my race for state legislature, but being on the state committee is great too. Um, I'm in a very red district, so I didn't really think that I had a chance of winning on the state legislature, but I knew I needed to do it just so that I could talk about important issues like universal health care and Medicare for all. I ran on a healthcare platform and I was able to use that, um, the, the advocacy um, that you get with the press. You know, a lot of the times when you're talking about issues um, as an organization, the press won't really talk to you, but if you run <laughs> as a candidate, all of a sudden you get a lot of interview requests so I really highly encourage anybody on the call who's kind of on the fence about whether or not to run for office to do it just 
just so that you have that ability to talk to the press about the important issues that um, organizations like PDA support. So um, I also want to talk about other good news because I feel like we need some good news. Um, I don't know if you all spend a lot of time on Twitter, but um, I do, and it's been um, a rough couple weeks on Twitter. And then um, this last week was pretty rough too. In fact, it's been a rough year, but I do have good news of something that came out of the negotiations um, with the reelection of Nancy Pelosi, which was um, that the Progressive Caucus was able to get PAYGO restrictions lifted on any COVID related um, legislation. So the legislation that Dr. Bill was speaking to earlier, um, it's called the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, which I'll share actually on the screen here. Um, it most likely will have a different number coming up once it's reintroduced, but this would be exempt um, from PAYGO restrictions as per the new um, rules that were negotiated um, recently. So um, as you can see, it had quite a few co-sponsors to begin with, but we really want to push this legislation uh, so that we get more co-sponsors in the future. Um, so I will share the link to this in the chat so that you can kind of see where um, your state's representatives have been historically on this bill. Of course, it was just inter um, introduced in 2020 because it's COVID related. But um, if your uh, representative isn't listed right now, then there's a chance that they might not even know about this bill. So definitely contact them. And I believe that there's been a link shared in the chat several times with a letter writing campaign that's very, very simple. All you do is put your name and your address and it will bring up your representatives for you. And then you just, with one click of a button, you can send a letter to all of your representatives at once. Your senators, because it is there is a Senate bill and there is a House, uh, house bill as well. Um, so yeah, it's very, very exciting that we can get this done. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by what the Progressive Caucus was able to negotiate um, and let me stop my share here. I'll go ahead and um, copy and paste this into the chat right now. Um, I, don't, I will say that I'm really impressed with Alan. He was able to talk and post things into the chat at the same time. I have not been able to accomplish that multitasking yet with Zoom. <laughs> so um, well done, Alan. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I'm happy to take any questions about this um, strategy. The, the idea is, is that um, we, and we, one pair of states have been talk, talking about this bill for, since it's been introduced. The idea is, is that if we were able to get this bill passed and people could get onto the Medicare system, just like in every other country when they pass like a single payer type system, people are reticent to ever go back because they, it's so popular. We feel this, this bill will lead to everybody being like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Getting on Medicare is awesome. So we should pass Medicare for all. Um, and also the letter writing campaign that one payer states and PDA are um, pushing does talk about Medicare for all. So in one way we're fighting for this, but we're also leading up to the fight for Medicare for all, which is near and dear to my heart. Whole Washington um, supports the national bills. I'm the field director for Whole Washington and one pair of states. We support the national Medicare for all bills. And um, we also will have a state bill introduced again in this session. And we're gearing up to run an initiative. But um, so like, like I'm saying, Medicare for all is really near and dear. So we're, we're really in it for the fight to get this done nationally. Um, so uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions about this strategy. I'm just really, really excited about the potential to redirect um, our positive energy in, sing in the single payer movement and, and get this, this bill passed. Well, thank you, Georgia. And, um, and thank you, Donna, for, uh, for uh, introducing Georgia as well, adding to the introduction. Uh, I know that your group, it's its not just because uh, it looks so damn good that you're wearing that red beret, it's your your group uh, is the red berets for Medicare for all, right? Up there in uh, Washington state. So, uh, and of course you have weather that's conducive uh, to, 
uh, especially at this time of year. So, um, but uh, I, I do follow the Red Berets uh, for Medicare for All and, um, and it, it is, you know, just a powerhouse group, uh, advocacy, advocacy group for uh, basically what I call universal healthcare, which is where all the people get all the care, right? So um, it is healthcare justice and that's what you're fighting for. Um, so, so we can kind of turn this into a bit of a discussion. I think we have some time. Um, I would like to know from you, um, and you know, if Chuck wants to jump in too, perhaps with a one pair of states uh, advocacy, um, because all of the states are working on this, this notion, I think is, um, is you know, uh, uh, the, the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, which of course in the previous session was authored in the House by uh, Pramila Jayapal in, in the Senate by Bernie Sanders, um, you know, uh, it didn't take off the way all of us wish it had. I mean, despite the fact that we were um, lobbying for it, you know, kind of citizen lobbying. We're not uh, technically lobbyists, but our, through our Educate Congress campaign, we had uh, dropped that uh, in our letters, uh, monthly letters, uh, numerous times to our members of Congress. Uh, and, and we know as more or less uh, enlightened individuals that, you know, that it didn't really need a pay-go exemption because it will actually save money, cost less money, but you know, in order to raise the funds, um, that then you know, uh, it, as whether it's an investment for the uh, job transitions and that kind of thing, um, you know, somebody somewhere. I I always tell people that um, it would at least take away the industry argument against uh, you know that that oh this is not going to fly with you know with paygo um, with the paygo restrictions from the house. Um, did we see that as a significant holdup from it passing through, from getting more co-sponsors and going through the committee process in the previous Congress? And is that why, you know, we're looking at, at a better chance in this new session of Congress? Are, are you asking that of me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you know, do you see that as being the case? Um, you know, are we looking at a, a kind of a, a new fresher chance to to get this through the new congress than we had the last time i think so and i think that um we should seize upon this opportunity just because that conversation is being had also and also COVID 19 demonstrates more than ever that um, we should not have employment-based uh, health care coverage it's just makes zero sense um especially during a pandemic um when people are millions of people are losing their jobs. So we have a, this is a unique moment in history and we need to take action. I, I think that maybe one of the reasons why it didn't get as much traction as we all hoped is because there's such a strong coalition of groups um, and movements around the Medicare for All bill. And since this bill is relatively new, not many people know about it. I think if more people know about it, which it's great that we're having this um, meeting with so many, I mean, 168 people, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's fantastic. And I'm sure uh, 168 people, but those people all have connections with groups in their area. Maybe it's PDA groups, maybe it's League of Women Voters, our revolution groups. If you can share information about this bill um, and use your organizations to pressure your legislators to get on board with this bill because it isn't very well known. Um, I just started organizing around it recently myself. So I think that we really just need to get information out about it. And just to just to reemphasize, um, the, the bill as it will be reintroduced would be basically the same as it was in the previous Congress, which is that it would pay all of the bills if your current insurance has you, you know, having a, a, a deductible or copay or surprise hospital bills or out of network expenses. Um, this bill covers all of those expenses for all medical treatment, not just COVID treatment, right? So it really is temporary Medicare for all in the setting of the pandemic, whenever that's, uh, however that's defined 
as being a period of time until the pandemic is over, right? And then, then the challenge will be taking it away once the pandemic is over. Yes, yeah, um, it allows people to get Medicare coverage who have lost their insurance um, because of, well, it doesn't have to be due to COVID, but if they don't have insurance, it allows them to get onto Medicare. Um, actually, Chuck is more of a policy expert than I am about that sort of thing, so maybe he can jump in and, and explain exactly what the bill would do. I'm, I'm a campaign person, so that's kind of my, my lane that I stay in. Well, the, the policy can go nowhere without the campaign. So, uh, so yeah, I've got Chuck and Alan with hands raised at this point. Um, Alan, is it okay? We because you know I don't know if Alan needed. Okay, so Chuck, uh, want to jump in on that? Uh, like like Georgia said. Yeah, this uh, George has done an excellent job here. We have a real opportunity in the moment. Um, we're looking at a situation where the president has put absolute emphasis on uh, the ending the pandemic, uh, economic recovery, and distribution of the vaccine. And our and Medicare for all, especially the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, wedges right into that whole discussion. It, it's seamless. It ties together, and we have to make that educational argument. We also have to look back at the at the proceedings of the last election season where, where Bernie's team and Biden's team came up with a unity statement saying that, that the state should, allow, should be allowed to move forward. But what we need to make the argument is, is that the states can't move forward without, without a, a Medicare-like system. And the quickest way to do that is through Congress now during a pandemic. The other thing about the legislation is, is that we need to uh, uh, amend the existing or the previous legislation, 6906, and then I think Senate Bill 3702, I think that's right, I'll check that out, is, is to make sure that the sunset clause is revised because I think Alan cited this at the beginning, the absolute mess, uh, uh, absolute chaos around the distribution of the vaccine is, is that, is that how do you define the end of the pandemic? How do you define the end of the crisis? How do you define when we're actually out of the woods here? We need to make sure that that, sun, that sunset clause is revised in such a way that gives absolute uh, 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 liberal interpretation of, of, of when we're out of a crisis so that we need to define it in a way that, 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 that wraps around all of these interconnected crises so that the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act will push out as far as possible. The benefit there, as Georgia was talking about, is it'll get people more and more conditioned to understand what Medicare actually does for people. And it becomes all the more permanent once it becomes a permanent part of, our, of, our, of an ongoing part of our, our society. So the negotiations between Biden and Sanders are very helpful. And of course that language found its way into the Democratic National Committee platform. And now it's finding its way into the language uh, coming out of the upcoming Biden administration. And we have uh, HHS uh, Secretary uh, Javier Baseca, who, is, who has historically been positive on, on uh, single payer. So I think the stars are aligning here. If we get to work and we get pressure on an encouragement to Pramila to introduce her Emergency Guarantee Act soon, immediately, as quickly as possible, and Bernie, the same thing, introduce the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act as soon as possible, that will add momentum to the larger national Medicare for all legislation as well. These things go hand in hand, they complement one another. The thing about one payer states and, and, and PDA is that we look for opportunities and there's an amazing opportunity right now. So everyone, please roll up your sleeves, let's get to work, get Pramila and Bernie to get the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act renewed in the, in the new legislation and let's get this to work. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you, Chuck. But uh, before you jump off, um, we do have a question about, uh, uh, do we have a simple explanation of PAYGO and how that applies here? Because uh, a lot of us are presuming everyone's heard of PAYGO already. I mean, I'm presuming. Um, so we do have a question in the chat. Um, sure. if, if one of you wants to go ahead and explain uh, PAYGO and how does that apply? Yeah, I mean, just simply, and then Alan can add to this, Georgia, Donna, anybody else here in the room who's, who's on top of it. My understanding of PAYGO is, is, that, is that Congress has to identify the money before they can actually spend it. It has to be money that actually exists. Here, the, the Congress is, is then authorized where COVID-19 spending is related, is that they can go into, they can borrow the money to spend it. 
right? And it's gonna take money to get the Medicare emergency uh, Medicare distribution um, off the ground. So it's gonna take upfront money actually going to save us money, of course, longer term, but there's an initial outlay, and that's what the PAYGO uh, uh, restrictions had previously prevented, and now that they've been set aside for, again, uh, uh, COVID-19 spending issues, uh, that, that we can move forward here. So the concept is like the old unfunded mandate type thing. It has to be funded, so it's pay. You have to pay for it before you can go, right? So pay and then go. So it's a funded mandate. Um, and uh, like you said, I mean, you know, why not authorize the, the National Defense Production Act to pay for it all? You know, for that matter, just like we would a war, why not declare war against COVID at this point and, you know, do it that way? That's what we might all expect. So, um, yeah, but at least that was negotiated and is no longer a blocking point in in moving the legislation forward. Exactly, thank you. Okay, all right, um, Alan, maybe you have more on this too or something else. Let, you let, me, let, let me say quickly though, fully in solidarity with Georgia, as you'll see Georgia, I am not so adept at this. Um, Danette or Mike Fox, if you have the liaison sign up link, can you get that handy? Cause I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Quickly on Paygo, of course, Paygo has been completely thrown out the door during the COVID-19 crisis, though not to the degree which it needed to be because the stimulus packages have not been adequate. But the CARES Act, for instance, there was no consideration for Paygo at all, of course. Um, that was, uh, we just ballooned the deficit as because we we're in a national emergency. Uh, Paygo, by the way, you can, sit, can look at it two ways. Democrats in Congress, Republicans in Congress, are, are there four players. The, then, but then there are Democrats in the White House and Republicans in the White House. Uh, the Democratic Party in recent times has practiced PAYGO uh, at all times. The Republican Party um, only does it when there's a Democratic administration. So they completely don't care about deficits when you have a Republican administration. Of course, it runs through building up military defense spending of the Reagan years and tax cuts after that. And they balloon the deficit. And for some reason, the Democratic Party refuses to um, do what we all want them to do, which is to uh, utilize deficits to fund social spending and cut reactionary spending, but just go with deficits in order to fund what's necessary, which are social programs and the progressive arm of the state. But they never do, and they haven't yet. But now we are finally making momentum on this issue. It is becoming something that more and more people in the country are becoming conscious of. And Chuck uh, is absolutely 100% correct in, in everything he said there. Um, okay, so the darn thing is I always get the name of this wrong. I, I, I invert the words, but the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. Okay, as we've said on all these calls, and now we'll say again on this call, in the next few weeks, we're going to be launching the PDA Congressional Liaison Program, which is basically a new and improved and expanded version of our and monthly letter drops, but it's much more direct. And we're gonna aim for 222 Democratic congressional districts across the country. So what are we going to do? Every month, just like the letter drops, we're gonna feature one piece of legislation. There are other details about how this project will work. We're building an electronic toolkit, which we'll be sharing with the PDA universe in about two weeks time. So the very first liaison educate Congress project, what will we feature? Well, if it's reintroduced, one thing, and I was talking to Michael Leidy about this earlier today, we will feature is the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. So we will go to every Democratic congressional office in the country, or as many as we can get to in our first volley. And of course, this is all happening digitally at this point. But, you know, follow up with phone calls, talk to the local congressional staffers, ask for a meeting with the Congress people, and we will advocate for one or two things in the very first liaison letter drop. Um, and that is um, a stimulus package in general. And the single thing we'll focus on if it is already introduced is again, to get the name right, the, employ the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act, because this is something we will advocate. In the second month, we're gonna go Medicare for all because that won't have been introduced by the end of January. And so maybe at that point, it will be a twofer with the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. So this is something that we all can participate in just sign up for the PDA liaison project 
and we will be going to Democratic congressional offices. Constituents will be the people who will be going. Nobody but, if you are a constituent, will be going to your own congressperson. I myself, to Jimmy Gomez, CD34 in California, okay? Can we drop that sign up for the liaison link into the chat? Has, does anybody have access to that immediately or quickly? It's been tossed I'm, in multiple times, Alan. Thank you, Mike Fox, you're the greatest. And see, Georgia, I struggle with that just like you. Great presentation, Georgia, thanks. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed being here and I'm ex super excited that you all are taking um, this very important piece of legislation on. I think that like Chuck said, um, it, it, it really is the roadmap to getting Medicare for all passed because once people have it, they're, they're really not gonna wanna let um, such a great system go. Georgia, is it possible to get your contact information? This is yeah. what you need. My, uh, my email address is Georgia, like the state, at wholewashington.org, and that's W-H-O-L-E, washington.org. If you'd like, um, I can also send you the email that we're going to send out through Whole Washington and One Pair States to encourage people to sign on um, mm. to this letter writing campaign. Um, and that way you don't have to come up with your mm. own language for that. Um, and if you have like a local organization, local PDA or, or our revolution or whoever you work with that you think is willing to send out this, this letter and um, get more people to sign on to talk to their representatives about why they should co-sponsor the bill, I, I can send that um, language to you if you just email me and I'll put my email address in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> We have a question for Mike Hennington. Uh, yes, um, uh, we're lucky to have uh, legislators that are already on board, uh, most of them. And the form letter looks like it allows you to send only one version to all three of the uh, uh, legislators. I wonder if you can change that. Uh, first of all, we really want to thank those that are uh, already supporting it. So the wordage should, should go that way for those. So. Um, I, that's the question is, can we individualize these letters? I think the way that I have it set up is that you can edit the letter. Um, once you get to that page in Action Network, um, you can personalize it however you want, whether that's a thank you or whether you want to tell a healthcare story, which is really um, a great thing to add if you have a personal healthcare story, you want to tell your representative about why they should support um, this legislation, you know, if you have lost your health insurance or you know somebody who has lost their health insurance, that's a good thing to, to add in that personalization section. Or you can just send it as is. You don't have to think about it at all. It's really quite an easy process. Well, my, my question is, um, the, there are three separate letters that I'd like to send. It looks like I have to fill in all, for, for all three before I can proceed and send a letter. Hmm. So, well, maybe um, I can talk to you about that. That doesn't hmm. sound quite right. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, maybe we can meet up after this meeting and I'll, I'll see what's going on with that. Okay. Thank you. All right. I believe we actually lost Dr. Bill for a minute. Uh, Dr. Bill, are you back in here with us? I am back here. Hot dog. <laughs> hey, Dr. Bill, in the meantime, I, I see uh, a question came in from YouTube, and you've probably, it's probably already been said, but people are asking for a bill number, but will the bill number change when it's reintroduced? Is that what we're waiting for? So, uh, Georgia or Chuck, if you have more information on this, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, if, if I, my understanding is it depends on the level of support it had in the previous session. If it had a lot of support, then they do try and move it uh, so it has the same bill number once again. Um, just like we had with uh, HR 676, we, we kept that number for, for many years under uh, John Conyers, of course. 
uh, Georgia or Chuck, do you, do you have more information on that for the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act? I think I saw Alan's hand go up. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it'll have a new number this time. That was entered very late into the last Congress. And since it goes in succession, they would never wait until um, that late in the game right now. This will be introduced as soon as possible. We'll have a new number. A, a shorter number, an earlier number, right. Um, I would just like to, uh, so sorry, sorry all, I am having internet connection issues, uh, but uh, thank you uh, for letting me back in and uh, as moderator again, I'm happy to um, entertain more questions, comments from the group. If you could use the raise hand function in Zoom, uh, we'll put you in a queue. And uh, so uh, myself or other uh, co-hosts or the host can, can call on you for that. Uh, if I happen to get disconnected again, uh, then we'll go into our backup uh, procedure here. Uh, Mike Fox, <laughs> if you can make me a co-host again. I can, Thanks. Dr. Bill, I can add a couple very quick small items here. Um, our good friend up in Washington State, David Loud, who's a former aide to Representative McDermott, very close to Pramila's office. He's, he's um, uh, working with that office on two fronts to get the sunset language changed for the better and also to get the bill introduced ASAP, uh, what Alan was just talking about. And also I'm, I've reached out to Lori Sanders, uh, Bernie's uh, 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 legislative director. If other people have contacts in Bernie's office, certainly let's, let's pivot and, and, and uh, you know, put that request in there as well. And if you have any thoughts to add on that, Alan or Donna. Thanks. All right, I'm taking that as negative. I see um, only one hand up so far uh, for comments, questions regarding this issue. Um, maybe we can keep it to this issue first. And uh, Jenna Beck from um, South Orange County, California, and uh, welcome back. Uh, you were in Georgia on the ground uh, canvassing for, for votes, so we want to all uh, exalt you and uh, say we're not worthy in your presence for, uh, for being there and uh, getting the wins for both Warnock and Asaf. Thank you so much for being there on our behalf, and welcome back. We all hope you're healthy and safe still. So far, so good, Dr. Bill. You know, um, I have to quarantine at least seven days, so I have to wait till Wednesday of next week. But I have no symptoms, so I think I'm in the I'm in the clear. And um, yes, yeah, not to brag, but I did knock on over a thousand doors, and I brought in thirty-seven ballots. Just saying. But anyway, um, my question is this. Okay, so we um, we admittedly, I think a lot of us can admit this at this point that we have a lot of bad actors who are within the progressive movement and trying to take over the M4A movement and make us look like caricatures, make us look like it's ridiculousness and stuff. So we have people like Jimmy Dore out there who are like, I'm all for M4A right now and I'm going to harass and and uh, just uh, pressure our progressive champions who legit are trying to get the legislation for us and, and get them to act on bad strategy that doesn't help us. While at the same time, he was supporting Tulsi Gabbard for a year and a half, who legit was not supporting M4A. And now he's trying to assert himself as the champion of M4A when legit he's just an internet personality who is just trying to influence people. How do we get past these weird personalities who are trying to take over what we're doing who are bad actors who are disruptors and who are trying to make us look ridiculous um and non-strategic when we are trying to be strategic in our methods of actually getting this legislation passed and they get involved at every level these are people who don't even believe in the democratic party and reforming the party Wait, get, I know you got your hand out, but let me just finish my thought. 
they don't even believe in reforming the Democratic Party. And they they come after us as organizers and trash us and smear us and make it near impossible for us to enter and reform the party. What do we do about these people? So so uh, you are tough and uh, you're bringing up a tough issue. And uh, so I know you can take uh, tough criticism from uh, folks like uh, the likes of Jimmy Dore. So, uh, so I'm going to um, uh, pass this first to our guest uh, guest speaker. Um, so thank you for that question, Jenna Beck. I think it helps to put it in the context of our activism and what we're trying to accomplish. Because uh, as you know, as I've said on many occasions, and I just said in my narrative at the beginning of this meeting, I think it's about policy over process, over personality. So uh, so to me, it's the policy and then running with that in terms of activism, which I, what I think our guest speaker, Georgia Davenport is all about. So Georgia, what's your take on, on this uh, forcing the vote? Uh, Cause I know you're, you're in it for the long haul as well. And thanks Jenna for that question. I was kind of talking about when I first uh, started speaking is on the last few weeks on Twitter. It's been personally demoralizing to me to see so many people fighting who are on the same side, essentially, or supposed to be on the same side, essentially. And yet I feel like our movement suffered greatly because of some of the ways that the conversation was being had, um, which is really why um, I wanted to celebrate the um, victories that the Progressive Caucus was able to accomplish in the last couple of weeks. And um, that, that's part of the strategy is to celebrate that we have this piece of legislation that is no longer required to adhere to PAYGO and maybe, re like I said, redirect the energy to something positive that we can all kind of unite together on. I know there's some people who are not gonna be able to unite after this. And that's really, really sad to me. Um, but if we can kind of shift the conversation to something positive and where we can be effective, I, I would like to attempt to do that. <laughs> so um, that's why like, I'm really excited to work with Chuck and Dr. Bill and everybody with PDA so that we can jump on this um, and, and perhaps get this passed and eventually Medicare for all. And, and I, but I do hear you. I do hear you. <laughs> Definitely, it was it was a tough couple of weeks. But if we can turn this around, um, then that'll that will be great. But I'm I'm willing to also listen to what other people have to say about that. Um, it is it is a tough topic. Well, I and as you know, I agree with you. That's why I say we're transition from force the vote to move the vote. Okay, so this is that's why they call us a movement. I think so. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thanks, Jenna, for your question, comment. I see um, next in the queue is a phone uh, person at 414-603. If you can unmute and first, please tell us who you are and where you're from. 404 and uh, last numbers are six, or 414 and last number 603. Are you able to unmute? and tell us who you are and where you're from. Are you there? The 414 area code phone number. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I, my fingers got a little fumbly there. That's okay. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to join the Zoom part of the meeting, sure. so I did call in. And um, my name is Sue. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right. Hi, Sue. And <laughs> hi, this is my very first time calling in. And I just want okay. to first say that, um, you know, thank you to everyone uh, who's doing such hard work. Um, it's very um, gratifying to hear. And one of the questions I have, I think maybe would be more geared towards Georgia, is um, the Medicare for all, does that include um, dental? Because right now, Medicare 
will only cover dentures and partials. They do cover um, exams and x-rays, but only, I think, uh, once or I think once a year or twice a year or something like that now. They do cover okay. extractions, but um, that's it. So if somebody needs more extensive work, for example, a bridge um, or um, even a dental implant, that that's something that every you know they have to pay out of pocket. It can be very right. expensive. Right. Yeah. Sue, so, uh, thank you so much. Um, absolutely. Let's let Georgia uh, answer, and I think I know the answer. Thank you. Georgia, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Great that, to have you with us. That's a great question, and I get that a lot. You know, um, when people think of the current Medicare, it only covers eighty percent. You have to have all these supplemental plans. Um, and it doesn't cover vision and dental, at least not to the extent it needs. Well, the Medicare for all bills that we talk about um, are expanded and improved Medicare for all. So it covers vision, dental, and it's 100%. Um, it allows the government to negotiate pharmaceutical costs and it's just gonna save a ton of money, um, but it's not the current Medicare system as we know it. It's much, much improved. That's right. And also includes vision and hearing. And um, so if you could, um, everybody, uh, I do see hands raised uh, for Stefan, Ira, and Betty. If you could hang on just a second, um, we're going to um, toss this back to Mike Fox because we are at the, the, the top of the hour once again. Um, Mike Fox, our weekly to-dos, just to recap. And Georgia, if you can stay with us, we'd so appreciate it. And thank you again for being with us today and working on this, uh, this project for the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. I know, uh, you know, we have absolute solidarity in this house. So thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Mike Fox, are you there for the recap on the PDA to do's for the week? Indeed, Dr. Bill, thanks so much. Uh, recap, or I should say, to do number one is my thanks. Uh, to the following folks, Johnny T, uh, Nurse Judy, Dr. D, uh, James W, David P, Tim M, Michael P, and Mark, Mark Z for your kind, oh, and T Tom F, uh, for your kind donations, and G, my goodness, and there we go. That's the end of the folks who have donated up to this point. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Uh, we're still about $350 short of our goal for the day, so uh, I'll be tossing the donation link in once again here. Let's see if we can get that up to um, up to our goal. Um, secondly, uh, a reminder to email me at mikefox at pdamerica.org, mikefox at pdamerica.org, if you are willing to pile on with any of our campaigns that we have going on right now. Those include uh, the liaison program that Alan had mentioned previously. You will be taken by the hand and shown how to uh, connect with your local congressional office and bring them on board with expanded and improved Medicare for all. Uh, number two, uh, if you are a phoning type, join our phone bank. Uh, we have a gazillion different ways for you to be involved, not only pushing our uh, expanded and improved Medicare for all campaign, uh, but likewise helping out candidates who will be single payer healthcare candidates like Nina Turner, who is running in Ohio in a special election. There will be other special elections coming and we wanna make sure that those, uh, that those folks get elected. Um, we, we all threw in really hard into Georgia and we need that same kind of push here uh, to bring these races home. So Mike Fox at pdamerica.org, M-I-K-E-F-O-X at P like progressive, D like Democrat, america.org. And uh, let me know how you can get in the game with us. Literally, if you want to get on the phone, I can have a list in your hand in the next hour. So let's pile on that um, if you possibly can. And otherwise, keep your eyeballs peeled on the 
the chat as we continue through the end of the show. Uh, and in the lower right-hand corner, again, before you log off, in the lower right-hand corner of the chat are three little horizontal dots. Click on that, and you'll see a way to save this chat with all of these links. All right. Now, if that's if you're not seeing those, the best way to ensure you have all of those links is just start clicking on them and your browser will open up and there you are. So we want everybody. The easiest thing to do is to pile onto those petitions. That's a piece of cake that takes 13 seconds. We expect everybody on this call to make that happen. Uh, and otherwise, uh, hit that button, or not a button, but uh, the three dots in the lower right-hand corner. Save the chat so that you've got all these links and notes, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll stop yapping. Back to you, Dr. Bill. Well, thank you, Mike Fox. And I want to thank you, especially for uh, your help and Mike Thaler to um, to make one of those petition asks for folks in California, we're pushing uh, Governor Newsom to reapply for uh, the ACA Section 1332 waivers. He said he would uh, do under uh, Trump on his uh, day one of his administration in, in 2019. Um, we're hoping he does it uh, on day one of the Biden administration and uh, Javier Becerra as the new uh, HHS uh, department secretary. Um, and we have a petition for that and a wonderful video that goes along with it. So, uh, so folks can uh, find that maybe one of my California friends can post uh, that link in the chat as well for us.